Status Epilepticus Algorithm by Dr. Sally Vitale. Please note that in this video we will be following the guidelines used at Boston Children's Hospital. Some of this information may need to be modified based on the equipment, guidelines, and practices in place in your institution. Hi, I'm Sally Vitale. I'm one of the attending physicians in the Children's Hospital Boston Medical Surgical Intensive Care Unit. I'm going to talk today about status epilepticus, uh, mechanisms and management of the condition. I'm going to talk about the Children's Hospital Boston Code Team Training Manual guideline for the initial management of seizures. Depending on your institution's policies, you may have to uh, modify this algorithm for your own use. In the first zero to five minutes, the drug of choice uh, for, the, for the first agent to use was someone who's continuously seizing uh, or intermittently seizing but not coming back to consciousness in between their seizures is lorazepam. And the dose for that is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per dose. Uh, this uh, get, reaches a maximum at uh, four milligrams per dose. So for a 40 kilogram child and over, you would use four milligrams and not go up beyond that dose. You give this uh, IV over two to four minutes. Um, and the default uh, at Children's Hospital Boston is to, uh, if a patient has no IV access, to give a dose of rectal Valium, uh, diazepam, which is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per dose. Um, and that dose uh, reaches a maximum of uh, 20 milligrams. Uh, also, therefore, um, uh, for a child of 40 kilograms and over, you would give uh, the maximum dose of 20 milligrams rectally. Uh, what people often ask why uh, rectal Valium instead of giving intramuscular uh, agents like uh, intramuscular Ativan. And we just know that the st studies are, are there that prove that uh, rectal Valium is absorbed uh, very readily and has a very rapid effect and therefore that's been our choice for the first agent if there's no IV access. But obviously we're working very hard to obtain IV access during this time. Uh, so that when you get to the 10 minute time frame and the seizures either are still persisting or a uh, patient is uh, not come back to consciousness between seizures, uh, then you would give another dose of Ativan, uh, lorazepam, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per dose. And you would also start loading simultaneously with phosphenitoin. Uh, the phosphenitoin do dose is 20 milligrams, um, and you always have to include at our hospital the initials PE, which means phenytoin equivalents. And the idea here is that uh, phosphenitoin was a major revolution over the use of IV phenytoin several years ago, uh, and uh, everyone knew the dose of uh, phenytoin, and so when uh, phosphenitoin uh, modified and when, when the when the chemist modified phenytoin and put an extra phosphate group on people didn't have to remember another dosing for that drug but you always have to include the um, the PE there and the max for that is a gram so uh, a patient who was uh, 50 kilograms and over would receive a gram of phenytoin IV and the major revolution of phosphenytoin over phenytoin for IV use is that um, there's far less cardiac toxicity. And so therefore, instead of the old days when we had to load uh, phosphenitoin, load phenytoin, excuse me, over 20 minutes, uh, phosphenitoin can be loaded over seven minutes. And there's an important reason why you would want to finish the phosphenitoin load as soon as possible, because obviously if you're trying to control seizures within 30 minutes, uh, it's going to be important to use a drug that you have a good sense of whether it's working or not working rapidly so that you can switch to another agent if you're not having success with, uh, with this first line um, uh, epi anti-epileptic. Uh, if the seizure goes on and is persisting uh, beyond the 15-minute uh, time frame, uh, there you're going to give a dose of phenobarbital uh, and so changing essentially changing agents and using something that has a different mechanism of action that dose is 20 milligrams per kilogram per dose and it's given IV over 20 minutes this one does have to be given over 20 minutes uh, because of its cardiovascular side effects um, it's important to remember through all of the loading of these drugs that respiratory depression is possible at any time uh, it's possible from the first dose of Ativan, uh, and some patients make it through and don't have respiratory depression uh, as they're getting their phenobarbital load. Uh, but it's always a possibility. 
but an important point of my presentation is that we can manage the morbidity of respiratory depression very well. Uh, there's no, it's actually not really a morbidity. Um, patients can be intubated if they're having respiratory depression from these drugs. They typically come to our ICU. They wake up uh, a couple of hours to, you know, to a half a day later, uh, get extubated, and usually are back out on the neurology floor within a 24-hour period. So the morbidity of that, as compared with the morbidity of allowing someone to continue on, continue seizing, requiring more and more medications because we're holding back on the amount of drug that we're giving, is really not worth the trade-off there. So as we move into the 20 to 30 minute time frame, we actually can give another uh, half of a dose of phosphenatoin, now 10 milligrams PE, um, that's loaded over three minutes, uh, since it's half of the original dose. But you wanna make sure you remember that high phenytoin levels are known to, in, to cause seizures. Uh, and so, uh, especially for a patient who's already on phenytoin, uh, coming into all of this, you certainly would want to modify the procedure with which you loaded them up with, um, with phenytoin. But for the patient who is on no anti-epileptic and arrives uh, seizing, has never seized before, is in status epilepticus, this is certainly this algorithm, you know, you would want to we, we would want to follow to, a, to uh, the letter. Uh, and then also on this uh, page, you'll also see that there's a reminder that there are some metabolic derangements that happen, particularly with hospitalized patients um, that can lead to seizures. Uh, hypoglycemia and hyponatremia are the, the, the two that we think of most commonly. Um, I think in, uh, in neonates I often think about, uh, and, and uh, in very young children I often think about hypoglycemia, but in um, uh, the hospitalized patient, particularly on the surgical ward, uh, it's very common for us to find someone who's having a, a new onset seizure who's never seized before after an operation, and often this is related to hyponatremia from um, receiving several days of IV fluids, uh, not advancing on their enteral feeds and uh, ending up having uh, hyponatremia because their probably appropriate ADH release has caused them to hold on to free water and drive their serum sodium downward. Um, it's important, of course, to remember these metabolic derangements because if they exist, then no matter how, many, how much you go through this algorithm of treating status epilepticus with the, uh, the proper drugs, uh, you're not going to be able to stop the seizures until you give the agent that, uh, whether it's uh, glucose or um, uh, sodium, that the patient needs uh, to be able to stop this pathology. I want to go through a few take-home reminders uh, just to sum up what I want you to take from this talk. Uh, it's very important to follow the algorithm or your own algorithm as much uh, to provide as much medication as needed to halt status epilepticus in a timely fashion. And so I encourage you to uh, use the drugs um, at their appropriate doses at the appropriate time during the seizure for all of the reasons that I've talked about today. All right, thank you very much. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.